We are very pleased to have uh, two really wonderful presentations. The first is by Kristen Forbes, who will talk about globalization. And Kristen is the Professor of Management and Global Economics at the Sloan School at MIT. And she was, from 2014 to 2017, an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee for the Bank of England. Um, and our second presentation will be about technology. Uh, and uh, we have a presentation by Alberto Caballo, who is Associate Professor at Harvard Business School and also the founder of this Billion Prices Project, which he will tell us more about. So, Kristen, thank you. Okay, I have been asked to answer the question if it's all about globalization. And there's a lot of reasons why you might think it is. Uh, a lot of reasons why changes in the global economy would be affected to affect inflation, including in advanced economies. For example, take increased imports from low-wage economies. That would be a one-off reduction in prices and inflation. Take just increased trade more generally. Increased trade integration would mechanically mean a higher share of price indices are imported, and therefore prices would be more uh, uh, related to changes in global demand and supply. Um, or take the fact that emerging markets now have a greater heft in the global economy. So shifts in demanding uh, emerging markets increasingly drive shifts in commodity prices. It's been driven larger movements in commodity prices and oil prices more, uh, over the last decade, and that increased volatility in commodity prices and energy prices could feed through into prices in advanced economies, especially if effects are nonlinear, which there's some evidence of. And then there's also whole literature arguing that increased uh, global supply chains, the ease of just shifting small parts of a production process to where it can be done most cheaply would affect pricing decisions by companies. It will affect how exchange rates interact with pricing decisions by companies. And it could also reduce worker bargaining power within countries because it's much easier to shift small parts of production elsewhere where it can be done more cheaply. So lots of reasons why globalization might affect inflation, whether it's one-off effects or affect the whole inflation process or affect the Phillips curve relationship between domestic slack and prices. And if it does, there's some pretty important implications for central banks, as Janet Yellen mentioned in her introduction. So not surprisingly, there's been a few people working on if globalization has affected inflation. Here's just a couple of papers. For my comments, I'm going to draw on some research I've been working on for a couple of years that I presented actually right here at Brookings a few weeks ago. Um, but where the, the literature is moving is that globalization is important. Um, some of what is going on with inflation dynamics does reflect globalization, but it's definitely not the whole story. Some of the other factors we're going to talk about here today are also important. And the answer is also more nuanced than I initially had thought when I started working on this. Yes, globalization does seem increasingly important when understanding the dynamics of CPI inflation, headline inflation. Globalization is increasingly important in understanding the cyclical short-term ups and downs in inflation around the world, but globalization has had less important a role in explaining some of the recent patterns in core inflation and wage inflation. That's not to say it's not important. Globalization, some global factors are still important, more so for core inflation, only moderately so for wage inflation. But the real change in their impact has been on CPI inflation and headline inflation with just more moderate effects for wage and core inflation. And in, in the Brookings paper I did on this, this, these results are supported by coming at these questions through some very different approaches, different inflation measures, different techniques, different countries. And what I'm going to do today is just give you a couple of the key results, um, which all sort of support the same story. So um, let me start with principal components. What I do here is I have inflation data for about 35 advanced economies around the world, and I take out the shared principal component of these different inflation measures, basically how much inflation rates move together in these advanced economies around the world. And what you see is not surprisingly, producer price inflation, the brown line at the top, is cor pretty correlated around the world. Producer prices, high traded component, so not surprisingly, those prices move together in different countries. The interesting patterns are the other lines. CPI inflation now moves together much more tightly in countries around the world than in the past. So CPI inflation could be driven more by global factors around the world. But wage and core inflation, the purple and blue lines, still seem to largely move by their own beat in different countries around the world. There doesn't seem to be as big a global component, a shared component driving wage and core inflation as you have increasingly seen for CPI inflation. So there's a lot of reasons this could be happening. This sort of just patterns in the data doesn't tell you what's going on. So let's go a little deeper. 
And I'm going to show you some results from a Phillips curve analysis. Um, with all the caveats, this is uh, certainly problems with this framework. I wasn't sure what I'd find when I started. But it actually, when you do the Phillips curve for a cross-section of countries, you some find some pretty strong, pretty robust results. So what I'm going to do is first estimate the standard sort of workhorse Phillips curve model that uh, central banks, economists look at for large economies such as the US. Estimate inflation as a function of inflation expectations, lagged inflation, and domestic slack. And I'm going to measure domestic slack using a broad measure, not just unemployment. Then I'm going to do a simple uh, augmentation of that model where you also control for import prices. Um, it's a way to just control with one variable for everything else going on in the world. And those are the sort of standard workhorse models that really focus on domestic drivers of inflation. Then I'm going to do an augmented model where I control for several different ways globalization could affect inflation. Changes in oil prices, changes in commodity X energy prices, changes in the exchange rates, changes in global slack, not just domestic slack, and changes in the use of global value chains. And then I'll do one more augmentation of that, where I also allow global variables to not just have one-off shock effects on inflation, but also to affect this Phillips curve relationship of the, of, between slack and inflation. So basically, can a country's exposure to imports explain the flattening of the Phillips curve that we talked about today? So when I estimate those models for CPI inflation, I find the simple domestic Phillips curve, actually the variables all come in significant, um, pretty robust, expected signs, higher inflation expectations, higher lagged inflation, less domestic slack, all correlated with higher inflation in a cross-section of countries. So at least cross-section of countries, this sort of framework works pretty well. Uh, higher import prices also correlated generally with higher inflation. But where it gets more interesting is then when you control for the global variables. Those also all come in significant with the expected signs. So higher oil prices, higher commodity prices, X energy, uh, exchange rate depreciations, less world slack, and less use of global value chains is also all significantly correlated with higher inflation. So that suggests these global variables matter, at least in explaining CPI inflation. And then one more variant when I also allow for uh, exposure to trade or imports to uh, affect the flattening of the Phillips curve, which also comes through in this, this explains this is significant also. And it looks like it's quite important. So to give you a, some concrete example, um, if you look at the Phillips curve over the last decade relative to before the crisis, the Phillips curve has flattened, as we've seen in a lot of other work. Um, but import exposure explains over half of the flattening of the Phillips curve. So that shows globalization not only has direct immediate effects on inflation, but has affect this Phillips curve relationship with slack. So those are the effects for CPI inflation. So we all know what, though, in economics, if something's significant, it still may not be that important in magnitude. So to get a sense of how important including these global variables are to understand inflation, I also ran these models with rolling regressions and then calculated the errors. What if you estimate just a domestic model explaining inflation or add these different global variables? How much does that improve our ability to understand inflation? Um, what you want is smaller errors. So the lower these numbers, the better the model works. And what this shows is the black lines is when you, uh, the errors when you estimate the models with just domestic variables. The red is when you include the global variables. So it shows that including global variables does meaningfully reduce the errors. It reduces the errors of just this simple model estimating CPI inflation by over 12% on average. Um, particularly big reductions in errors around the global financial crisis. We're incorporating what's going on in the rest of the world is very important to understand in CPI inflation but also very important during this window from about 2012 to 2015. World slack very important, plays a role in commodity prices in explaining um, why our inflation models didn't do so well. If you add the global variables in the inflation models, you can again reduce the errors and improve the fit by about 12%. So not the whole explanation. The models are still far from perfect. There's still other things going on, but it does make a difference. If you go back and do the same analyses, though, for core inflation or wage inflation, you find the, the basic model still largely works. Domestic variables still important in explaining inflation. Global variables sometimes important. Exchange rates, commodity prices, often important in explaining core inflation, but less robust. Magnitudes are smaller and much less uh, importance of the global variables in explaining wage inflation. 
Also, there's a, I get some flattening of the Phillips curve when you estimate this for core inflation, not as much in wage inflation. In the flattening, it seems to be less related to increased trade exposure and increased import exposure for core and wage inflation. And then if you also estimate the model and see how much does adding these global variables reduce errors in models to explain core inflation on the left and wage inflation on the right, you find um, it improves the models a little bit, but not nearly as much as with um, when you try to estimate CPI inflation. So global variables meaningfully reduce errors in models of CPI inflation, only moderately reduce errors in models of corn wage inflation. So still helps to add them, but you're not going to explain any p apparent puzzles over the last decade. Um, so so um, so I could stop there, and when I presented this paper uh, here uh, a few weeks ago, that's largely where I stopped, but then Ben Bernanke asked me a very good question. Okay, so global variables matter for CPI inflation, but which ones? Um, by how much? And do they really matter that much for the U.S., basically? So I have an answer for your question now, so you won't ask me uh, in five minutes. Uh, so what I did is I took these models, and I, I estimated, used the estimated coefficients, plugged in the actual variables for the U.S., and then estimated how big an impact these global variables had on CPI inflation for the U.S. And this is what you find. Um, let's, start with, uh, let's start with some of the puzzles we've been talking about today. So during the period, sort of immediately during and after the global financial crisis, U.S. inflation was higher than many people had expected. What drove up U.S. inflation during that period? You see, at least from sort of 2010 on, um, the exchange rate um, propped up inflation by a bit, about 0.1. Oil prices and commodity prices, though, were important in the sort of 2009, 2010, 2011 in boosting up um, inflation during that period. Global value chains, um, by contracting, weren't dragging down on inflation as much as before. So that's a part of the explanation for why inflation was a bit stronger during the crisis. But where I think the biggest results come in is the period sort of after the crisis, the 2010-2015 window, when inflation was slower to recover in the U.S. than some of our models predicted. So how much of that was global variables? So what this suggests, uh, the dollar exchange rate on the top left was part of the story. That dragged down inflation a little bit, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. Oil prices, commodity prices also were a temporary drag. But I think the most interesting, what really hasn't received as much attention, is the bottom left. Uh, global value chains, as they picked up, trade started to in, in pick up more quickly, 2010, 2011, 2012, as emerging markets recovered more quickly. That acted as an important drag on inflation um, during that window. And then global slack also acted as a drag on inflation. Each of those effects by themselves are pretty small. You're talking you know, 0.1s or 0.2s, but if you add them all up, that does start to add up. And in comparison, the drag from domestic slack, there still was some, because again, I have a broader measure of domestic slack than just unemployment, but as the drag from domestic slack on inflation faded, you still had some pretty meaningful drags from global value chains and from global slack. So that's what can explain some of the puzzle. Again, not the whole story. Um, but then the obvious question is, so what's that mean for now? So my sample ends at the start of 2018. Um, but what it suggests is, at least from 2018 forward, a lot of these drags that were holding down inflation and presenting some of this puzzle aren't as potent anymore. Um, exchange rate effects are minimal. You know, I'm not even going to try to predict what's going to happen to oil and commodity prices there. Uh, but at least uh, world slack, which had been dragging on inflation in a meaningful way, isn't dragging as much. And global value chains, especially as trade tensions are flaring up and companies are reducing their reliance on the sort of network of global supply chains, that could be an important factor no longer keeping inflation down, um, which hasn't been fully incorporated in most of our standard models. So to tie up, um, I also have a whole set of results using a very different approach to modeling inflation out of the Phillips curve framework, breaking inflation into a trend and cycle. And you get very similar to results to what I just showed you today, which at least increases my confidence in this so set of results. Um, but to summarize where they all point is that globalization is increasingly important for understanding CPI inflation and the cyclical short-term movements in inflation. Wage, core, and the underlying trend inflation, though, are still largely a domestic process. Globalization matters a bit. It helps the models a bit. But it is really not the big explanation for any puzzles out there. Um, and in terms of which global effects matter for CPI inflation, 
Import exposure is important. It does explain a good part of the flattening of the Phillips curve for CPI inflation. And the other effects of globalization really do vary based on what period you're looking at and what the time window is. They, the global variables do seem to be important as a whole, but there are specific importance in any specific window depends on what variables and channels you're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers um, for inviting me here. So I'm going to, um, I tried to mimic um, Christine's title and just change the word uh, at the end. And I decided to put Amazon because I know that these days if you just put Amazon in the title of a paper, a lot of people pay attention. So, <laughs> But you can more generally think of this as um, online competition. You see it about technology, online competition, something happening in the, in, in the, uh, the, the market that is affecting pricing. And uh, as you probably remember, the story of the Amazon effect became quite uh, interesting, uh, particularly around the time uh, where we were seeing a low inflation two years ago uh, that seemed quite puzzling. Um, and the argument was that Amazon is somehow putting pressure on the margins of some of these retailers and constraining their ability to increase prices even in the face of rising demand. And, Gradually, there's been increasing interest in the topic of online competition. I, um, I personally, I should have mentioned this, I do a lot of work with online prices because about 10 years ago, um, we decided to start collecting a massive amount of data from retailers that uh, sell online through the Billion Prices Project, this academic project we have at MIT and, and Harvard. And uh, in a sense, our data set should be exactly what you need to detect if online competition with Amazon is really affecting the behavior of large companies that are in the middle of this offline and on online world. So I decided to try to tackle this question. Uh, there are others, I should mention, that have done uh, related research. Uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko has worked a lot on the characteristics of online-only type of, of, of pricing, and he has detected a tremendous amount of flexibility in prices online. Then we have other papers that are focused more on the measurement side and what does internet pricing does to the way we calculate pricing. This is that, that's the goods being clean up paper. I try to tackle this more as is there an Amazon effect and what is really the important Amazon effect that we should be focusing on in terms of inflation dynamics. And just to give you a preview of my answer, the story about the shrinking margin, I think, may be uh, relevant. The truth is I cannot observe those margins. These companies will not give us that information. But you can think of this essentially as if it is putting some pressure, it is a temporary pressure. Uh, there's a, so much that uh, margins can actually fall. And eventually, when those margins are very, very, very small, you would have to see some reaction, quite quick reaction to some of these changes. I think if you, if, if you want to take out something about how technology or online competition is affecting uh, inflation dynamics, I think it's far more important for us to focus on the way pricing behaviors of these companies have changed over the years. And so if we have 10 years of data, we can follow that over time. And there's one thing that we have detected, or, or I should say two trends that we have detected as being particularly relevant for the case of monetary policy. One is that the frequency of price adjustment has actually increased dramatically. Uh, in part, I think this is because of uh, pricing algorithms and the ability also to monitor what the others are doing and trying to mimic their behavior. And the second one is about uniformity in, in pricing across the US. Many of these online retailers have a single price. People have come to expect that they're going to get the goods uh, quickly in just a matter of days for free, in theory, in terms of shipping. And, and there shouldn't be any difference in how in the prices that they, 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 they observe if they're in Boston or, or San Francisco. And that is sort of making these companies price identically all over the US. So you put those things together. What does that mean for, for uh, inflation? I argue in this paper that it's basically making the, these prices more reactive, more sensitive to, I call them here, aggregate shocks. Uh, but you can think of them as national type of shocks. This is less about the local type of idiosyncratic uh, levels of inventory, for example, and more about what's happening on a national level, which can be uh, to relate it to, to Christine, uh, sort of domestic type of, of national shock, or you can think of it as a, as a global shock. And I'm going to show you, in particular, 
to argue that some of the slowdown that we had um, uh, in 2017-18 was actually related to uh, the cost type of shocks uh, in gas prices and, and the exchange rate. But uh, that has actually changed uh, recently, uh, and, and they're more inflationary uh, now. So let me walk you through the, the results and, 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 and document these facts. First, there's a, a tremendous amount of algorithmic pricing, at, at least in theory. Again, companies are not very straightforward about how, how this is happening. But since 2013-14, we've he been hearing stories of these companies uh, using algorithms to make pricing decisions. It sort of makes sense. We're letting our you know, algorithms drive our cars. Why wouldn't we allow them to make our pricing decisions? And certainly, these companies have a tremendous amount of data. It doesn't really matter if it's just one company or all the companies doing it. There's so, another characteristic is that many of these companies are monitoring each other constantly, and the cost of doing that has decreased dramatically. So if there's someone using these algorithms, others are replicating the same behavior, and, and you get the sort of pricing patterns affecting everyone more or less the same. And what I'm showing you here is basically how the duration, the implied duration, or you can think of it as how long prices tend to stay constant, uh, has shifted dramatically across all categories of goods, particularly in goods where you would expect online competition or competition with Amazon to have increased, particularly in recent years. You can see, for example, furnishing and household goods falling from about 14 months to just uh, six months in our data. And I'm keeping contacts co con constant, the sectors, the, the retailers, so we know it's not about the, the composition. No? Um, and in sectors where Amazon, at least until I finish the sample, does not seem to have much of an impact, you can see it's relatively stable. That may change the next few years. So there's this tremendous amount of flexibility. The second point, I want to, and it has increased over time, the, um, in the paper, I also try to link it specifically to goods that compete more with Amazon. And you do observe for those goods have particularly more flexibility. The second thing has to do with this uniformity of pricing, which is a little bit puzzling, because if they're using algorithms to change our prices over time, why are they not using them to sort of give us a very different prices at the same time? And, and, and here, the thing gets complicated. It's not a technological uh, constraint that they face. I believe they face uh, the fact that Online pricing has also made it tremendously transparent. You can see prices in different locations. And people have concerns if they see they're getting charged a different price for exactly the same good in a different location. We have, uh, there's this fairness concern. And if you talk to these retailers, they will tell you, we are very worried about using these algorithms to customize prices because we would break the trust of our, of our consumers. No? And this is an old story, by the way. Amazon faced some criticism in 2002 for allegedly trying to price discriminate and sell CDs at different prices to different people at the same time. And they promised never to uh, engage in, in, in pricing based on demographics again at that time. So technologically, they can. But in terms of transparency and fairness concerns, I think we are actually seeing the opposite. There's this uniformity. And what I'm showing you here is we did this sample where we collected data online and offline for 102 zip codes, 10,000 goods. We caught them ex uh, roughly at the same time. And what you can see is that the, the share of identical prices uh, across uh, zip codes for the same goods is nearly uh, perfect. It's higher in Amazon than in more traditional retailers, but more traditional retailers are not that far behind. So why does this matter? You put the two things together, and as I mentioned at the beginning, high flexibility and this sort of national pricing policies, you would expect them, the prices to be reacting more to these uh, sort of national cost shocks. And that's what I'm showing you here. In fact, you can take gas prices and exchange rates, which are two simple shocks that we can monitor. And you see that goods that are in direct competition with Amazon, in particular here I'm taking Walmart's prices, uh, they tend to uh, change prices more often. They tend to be more uniformly priced. And by the way, they tend to have a higher pass-through rate for gas prices, for exchange rates as well. And, and, and the paper sort of shows that the sensitivity to shocks has actually increased in our sample during time as well. Why, um, you may be thinking at this point, but this is exactly the opposite of what we expected to explain the puzzle. Uh, you know, they are adjusting faster to these shocks, so why aren't we seeing something? Well, I think it's, this is sort of pointing us in the direction of trying to identify what are the shocks that we have experienced uh, in, in the last uh, a few years. And in that sense, what I did here is try to um, show you how, first, with online prices uh, uh, in particular, 
you can actually find that the, 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 the volatility or the movements in gas prices and exchanges actually explain a lot of even the core prices that we can compute. So what you're looking at, the, in the, just focus on the orange line for a second, that's like an online core equivalent to the VLS core, but we compute it with the online data we get from these retailers that are arguably far more exposed to the Amazon competition than you would get in a CPI sample that has these retailers and others. And when you, I, I, I circled basically this time period where the puzzle was greatest, and if you look at it in the timing, Basically, until uh, January of 2017, when our, the annual inflation rate in online prices was falling, was a time where gas prices were falling and the dollar was uh, uh, appreciating. It started to turn exactly at the point where gas prices rose in January 2017 and, and the dollar started to depreciate and depreciated for roughly one year. Now, since then, you can think of these two forces of sort of balancing each other. We have a deep, an appreciation in the dollar. You have a relatively high gas prices. But the ups and downs that you see in this orange line are actually quite um, closely co-moving with, with gas prices. Uh, the CPI sort of shows you the same message. It's only shifted. It has a lag, no? which complicates the identification of this type of, of effects of this cost shock. So just to finalize, because I'm out of time, my view is that even core prices today, due to these technological changes, these changes in, in, in pricing behaviors, is becoming less insulated from these shocks. So my argument is we should sort of uh, be paying uh, attention from them. And it can go both ways. It can be more deflationary. But also, if some of these shocks start to pick up, um, we, will, we should be able to see uh, more inflation in the short run. Um, now, uh, if the focus is going to be on understanding these shocks, we need to think more carefully about what drives, what, what sort of variables actually affect these pricing algorithms and how the shocks are perceived by customers. I'm doing some research now on the trade war. I, when I started doing this, I expected the pass-through to be quite high. And what we've noticed is that at the retail level, there's, there's some limitation because of the way many retailers perceived how temporary this shock was going to be uh, or how easy it was going to be for them to, to, to wait a little longer before implementing those shocks. So, um, in any case, and I have a last point about measurement, but I'm way out of time, so thank you very much. I'm happy to talk about that later. Thank you. both for really fascinating and incredibly clear presentations. Um, I want to start with a clarification question from you, Kristen. Not really a clarification, but kind of an um, interpretation. So your finding is basically that globalization is sort of important for explaining headline CPI and even the flattening of the Phillips curve, which is really interesting, but not for core and not for wages. So. So one of the mechanisms I thought that where it might flatten would be, you know, there's no, you can't, you can't ask for wage increases because you've got foreign competition. Or so, how do you like? What is the economic story that explains that uh, distinction? I mean, I know you don't know it from the data, but what do you yeah. think? Yeah. So let me first clarify. So I still find some role for the global variables for corn wage inflation. So it's not saying it doesn't matter at all. Um, for example, when you put them in the models, they reduce errors by sort of three to eight percent or something, but not like what the twelve the to fifteen percent. Flattening, it sort of might explain about ten percent, if I remember from one of those uh, sort of baseline uh -huh. estimates. Yeah. Ten percent of the flattening, uh -huh. so it's a, it's there, yeah. but it's not nearly as strong as for the CPI. So I think there is a puzzle there. I think some of it um, could just be that we have had these huge some of the, uh, movements in commodity prices, oil prices, which are seen as short term. Um, so central banks, back to our first plan, panel, central banks may not respond to those because inflation expectations are well anchored. Um, so you don't get the reactions there. Um, I think there's also something going on, what also came up in the first panel, is there is this puzzle where um, 
uh, there has been, the wage uh, Phillips curve is working pretty well. You don't see the same flattening in that. So you haven't, and you haven't seen the same effects of globalization. Wages are now going up in some countries, but prices are not. So that does suggest there's something, as Silvana said, something going on with productivity growth maybe increasing more than we know. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Um, or firms are reducing their margins. And that's something that they could do for a period. Maybe there was some uh, excess profits in there that could be shrinking, but that can't go on forever. And if that's part of the story, then we might see some of these effects come through later on. Um, it may be a temporary, temporary effect. So that kind of brings into this sort of, you know, if, if you know, what's up with inflation? This is about, so how much do globalization and technology explain it? Mm -hmm. And to the extent they do explain it, um, you know, is it because things have been happening uh, that have sort of masked this underlying Phillips curve, as in the first panel, or because they fundamentally changed the structure uh, of the inflation process and of the, the relationship between output gaps and inflation. And I want to get both of your views on that for globalization and technology. Why don't we start with technology? Cause sure. So I think I'm more in the camp that it is masking the relationship. And, and it's basically because I believe um, I, I do notice that prices are quite reactive to some of these shocks. It's just a matter of identifying what those shocks uh, really are. No? And, and we may be placing too much emphasis on the very short run of what is happening uh, with the US, uh, which is understandable. Um, but I think we need to uh, acknowledge that uh, if we carefully try to uh, understand the incentives, the characteristics that each shock, uh, shock generates at the retail level, we're likely to, to understand better some of the, uh, the recent deflation dynamics. So I'm more in the camp of, of, um, of seeing this as, 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 as a relationship that is there, just that we are uh, not, uh, not considering the right type of shocks to see it. And the, and the, the uh, story that would say, well, but people don't have pricing power, so they can't react, right? Because now it's so easy to price compare. Is that not and so maybe that would change the slope. You don't think that's a... a well, I think that's a, a concern, particularly in the short run. Um, but then you can think how, how, low, how low can uh, margins fall and how sustainable it is, which uh, mm -hmm. what Christine is saying. So I did briefly mention, for example, that we were looking at the effects of the, of the trade war. Um, and what we do find is you can, you can think of this additional shock uh, being eventually passed on to consumers, but there are uh, some stages where... Uh, in the data, actually, this uh, can stop it. And one would be if the exporters from China were to drop their prices. We do not find that. We find that importers today are paying a significant cost in, in, uh, of the tariffs. So there's food pass through at the border. But then that doesn't necessarily assume that we should observe a very quick pass through at the consumer level. It depends on how uh, these retailers are internalizing that cost and how long they think they can sustain the reduction in margins. The evidence that we have currently in our research suggests that they are reducing some of these margins, but I question just how long that can be maintained. And I think we're, as soon as those margins are low enough or they can become convinced that the shock is permanent enough, we're going to see a very quick pass through into, into consumer prices. And, and if I ask you to explain sort of the puzzle that we started with, you know, not enough deflation, you know, during the Great Recession, not enough inflation now. And, you, and I said, so how much of the Amazon type effect can explain it? Not just the particular years that you point to, but like, is that an important part? Not an important part? Do you have a, a sense? Well, I, I think uh, uh, Christine's analysis was a, f a far more long-term type of analysis, yeah. no? in, in terms of that graph. I am mostly focused on the last uh, four or five years. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from that perspective, and knowing that some of this pricing competition is actually making prices quite reactive to these shocks, I think I can only explain or argue that there's not much of a puzzle going on with inflation when you take that into account. Now, usually, we, at least in academia, and I suspect it also happens at the Fed, we tend to have this impression that the pass-through rate from some of the shocks into retail prices is relatively low. So if we just remove them and we focus on core, we, we shouldn't be looking so closely at them. The point I'm making is I think we should uh, increasingly be more, more focused and and making the connection to commodity prices and, 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 and other uh, sort of uh, type of cost shocks. No? Great. Yeah. So actually, before I answer your question, one just yeah. comment on yours too. I think that our two results, there's a nice complementarity. 
where make, one part of my analysis that I didn't get into in much detail is you find these bigger movements in commodity prices over the last decade. Right. So that is a direct effect on CPI inflation, and right. you see it in your results. But what I also find is the sensitivity of uh, prices to commodity price movements has increased, which would also fit yes. with your story. Absolutely. And at my, the, how I justified that before seeing your paper was that there could be nonlinearities. There's some nice work right. by Hamilton and others that shows you know, larger movements in oil prices <laughs> lead to uh, larger adjustments by companies, and yeah. that fits with men standard menu cost price models, you know, right. bigger shocks, you adjust prices faster. And again, it also then would be accelerated by the effects you're getting. Right. So it's a nice link between the papers. Um, but back to your initial question of, so does globalization mean just sort of one-off effects in the level of inflation or the inflation process? Yeah. And what I find for CPI inflation, it's both. Yeah. Um, the global variables have had some big one-off effects, um, short-term effects on the level of inflation. Some could continue, depending on what happens with global value chains, et cetera. Um, but it also seems to have affected the process by which slack feeds through into inflation for CPI inflation. Core inflation, you still get some direct level effects, especially commodity prices, global slack have had some more role, um, a smaller effect on the Phillips curve, and then wage inflation, smaller still of both those, both the direct level effects as well as the channels um, through slack. So we sort of talked about what happened, what, how, how much we can explain of what's happened in inflation. Now going forward, like advice for monetary policy in the central bank, how does thinking about including these effects matter. So for example, these more frequent price changes, does that mean they should be focusing on a different measure of inflation? Does it mean that inflation will be moving around a bit more? Like, is there an implication for monetary policy just of this structural change in the economy and similar for globalization? So, so in terms of what to look at, I think uh, for, various, for my reasons, it's, it's important to incorporate the exchange rate and, 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 the, and gas prices. You can also think of relating it to the discussions of, of, of uh, inflation expectations, that's also why the Fed may want to pay more attention also to, to headline and to core. But um, I, I also wanted to make the argument that um, measurement can actually be changing because of this. Uh, we have uh, statistical methodologies that are based on uh, a very different uh, type of environment. Uh, and. Um, as you can think of uh, the frequency of price changes increasing, but in particular also the rotation of products changing, we should be thinking about whether we're, we're measuring well um, some of these uh, inflation statistics. And it's something that's often, I think, overlooked. We tend to think inflation is, is, is better measured than, than, than other statistics, but um, you can expect it to, to be playing a role as well. So I think it, my answer to that is pretty straightforward. I, I would like to see, especially in academics, there's still a tendency for academics who focus on inflation in the U.S. to just write a Phillips curve that yeah. ignores yeah. the rest of the world. Just have domestic slack, inflation expectations, lagged inflation, and you're done. Maybe yeah. oil prices. <laughs> um, so I would like to see at least academics doing these sort of simpler models include more terms to incorporate what's going on in the rest of the world. It can matter. Um, central banks do, when they're more complicated DSG models, do incorporate the rest of the world some. There's probably ways they could evolve that and put more weight on it. Um, but what I also came from all the work I've done suggests that the effect of the global variables does vary over time. Yeah. So you also do need to allow flexibility in these models, where sometimes some of these effects seem to be nonlinear, they seem to grow at certain periods, be less important at other periods. So you have to have that flexibility built in. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so again, we're going to take uh, like three questions at a time. Raise your hand, a mic will come for you, um, and state your name and where you're from. Any questions? Uh, way in the back there. Behind you. Hi, Michael Redmond, SPX Capital. And I hear kind of conflicting stories on both these issues. So sometimes you hear <clears throat> that we have increasingly comfortable monopolistic companies who don't have much competition. Other times you hear that you know Amazon and other forces are really pushing their margins and forcing them to pass through prices quickly. And then with globalization, you know, even before Trump, there's a lot of hand wringing about kind of the slackening of globalization that the hyper-globalization era had already ended. If you look at like import of intermediate goods, you know, that really flattened out already before kind of at the financial crisis period. So how do you kind of square these competing stories that you see from a lot of economists on what that means for inflation? Uh, David Beck, sorry, <laughs> David Beckworth, and this is maybe more for, for Kristen, but um, on the globalization front, 
you know, I know we're thinking about the U.S. here, the low inflation in the U.S., but if you look around the world, in all the advanced economies, Japan, Europe, we have this struggle. It's also where we see low real interest rates. And at Jackson Hole, you had this incredible graph that showed the real rate in the advanced economies going down. In emerging markets, it was high and robust. And we're also the parts of the world that provide the safe assets. So I'm wondering if there's a safe asset story here, the demand for safe assets being provided by the advanced economies, kind of a global you know, money demand liquidity shock that feeds into um, the low inflation in advanced economies. Why don't you take those two? Those two. <laughs> okay. No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me start with the first one. Um, sort of different stories about globalization. Has it increased? Has it decreased? Uh, especially uh, trade integration, global supply chains. Um, element, when I started working on this, I thought global supply chains, that's an easy concept. It's very hard to measure what you mean by that. There's very different, it's not just increase, because increased trade seems to correlate with GDP growth. So really fleshing out how much global supply chains are increasing. Um, I finally found some measures which not only get at how much trade there is in intermediate goods, but how much of that is complex in terms of crossing borders multiple times, just not one time. So the measure I use in this paper is, is a principal component of a number of different components get together what I, at least in my head, I think of as global supply chains. And when you do that, what you see is a pattern. Global supply chains increased, as you'd expect, pretty quickly pre before the global financial crisis, collapsed during the global financial crisis, came back pretty quickly, and are now at pretty high levels, stayed pretty high, and have started to decline a bit recently. And I don't have data for the last year. My guess is they would have declined even more the last year. So that's how you can get... Um, some different effects of these global supply chains on globalization over time. It contributed to higher inflation in the period right after the crisis as this mode of producing things more cheaply collapsed. But then it came back faster than growth in some advanced economies and contributed to lower inflation, 2012 to 2016, 2017. And we hit, now we're having a diminishing impact going forward. So that's the time series, I think, that gets at your question. Um, and the question about safe asset story, lower global interest rates, I think that's all probably all interrelated to some of this. Um, my, one of the key points I tried to politely make at this Jackson Hole discussion you referred to, though, was I think we put far too much weight on these estimates of this neutral interest rate. It's so hard to get at. The margins of error are massive, depending on how you estimate them. So I do where we're putting, we, I think the concept makes sense. But we're really wringing our hands over getting these exhaust estimates when we just can't. Um, but what, what I, I t I, where I think the safe asset story probably does play more role than sometimes gets attention is when you do get some of these shocks, you, you do get um, movements in and out of certain currencies which have the safe, a safe asset. And that does drive exchange rate effects, which do seem to be important, more important than I think many people take into account in terms of what's happening to inflation, especially as trade has increased, global supply chains. These exchange rate movements can have some pretty big effects um, on pricing. And in the U.S., people tend to say it doesn't matter much. It certainly doesn't matter as much in the U.S. as other countries, but at least my estimates suggest it is there. It, is, it does help it, on the margin explain some of these puzzles um, when inflation has been a little higher, a little lower. So I'd like to see more attention more through that channel, maybe less a focus on it exactly estimating this neutral hard start. <laughs> Yeah, and I completely con agree with that last statement. And maybe because I'm from Argentina, so everything that I see with prices, to my mind, has to do with exchange rates. But, uh, <laughs> but I, certainly, I think my results are suggesting there's, there's more pass-through than we typically assume. I want to say something. You, you said it's true that there are sometimes conflicting stories about the margins. Is, is, for example, Amazon in, in shrinking margins, or it's becoming you know, someone who will have huge margins and therefore do a lot of pricing. That's why I was trying to distinguish between the more traditional Amazon effect, which is the shrinking margin story. I think that's a short-term story. Uh, 20 years ago, people were talking about the effect of Walmart and how uh, imports from China were creating a Walmart effect. It can be useful to explain some sort of short-term deviations, and I'm not arguing it's, it's not, but I see it as a temporary effect. Now, in terms of how Amazon and online competition is changing the way pricing decisions are, are made, I think that's going to be important whether we are in a more you know, a deflationary environment or a, a, some of these costs start to pick up, and that's why I believe that's where we should focus and our, our, our emphasis on, 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 on the impact of technology uh, and its implications for monetary policy. All right. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Jamie Goldberg uh, finds that the first wave of tariffs uh, actually had a full, almost full pass-through of prices. Are you surprised by your results? Um, I, I would like you to comment. And then a comment on, I mean, mono, um, 
Amazon is not just a monopoly, it's also a monopsony when it buys goods, so maybe those are the margins that are shrinking and uh, can right. explain the, the fall. One over here. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Carl Polzer, um, Center on Capital and Social Equity. Um, if we had this conversation when the Phillips curve, curve was originated and the monetary system was developed, there'd be a lot of talk about labor and its bargaining power. Like headlines could affect the, the expectation of inflation and, you know, if they could shut down the steel industry. We really don't see that anymore. And now you see, um, if you go to McDonald's and you talk to people I have about should should you get a, a minimum wage increase that's significant? And they said, well, then our, our hamburgers are going to cost more. So are we seeing, in other words, oh, the flatness of the curve is a lot of it because labor is now more of an independent variable, I mean, or more of a de dependent variable and not independent actor? Is that a question, I guess? So just to answer lately what Sylvan asked, it's actually quite very consistent with the paper by Penelope Goldberg. There are other papers that have documented that at the border there's full pass-through. So it's not the case that the uh, Chinese exporters have significantly dropped their prices, so the burden is on the U.S. Now there's a question of whether that is being passed on to consumers, and that's what our paper sort of adds to the picture. We find exactly the same at the border, but we find relatively limited pass-through, and that's why I was trying to make an emphasis that we have to think carefully about the shocks and the sort of incentives <coughs> it generates. It's probably the transmission of that shock is going to be very different from a shock like gas prices, which can feed directly into these pricing algorithms and very quickly be observed at the, at the consumer uh, retail level. Um, in response to your question about labor markets, I think there are a lot of very interesting things going on. Um, when I was in the, working at the Bank of England and talked to companies around the UK, I was always amazed at how many companies would say, we can't find enough workers, we can't keep workers, and I'd say, well, just pay them more. And they'd say, no, we can't, because then our prices will be too high and we can't compete. So you <laughs> heard stories like that again and again. Um, and I think there's some very interesting dynamic going on. Some of it is globalization, increased competition with goods from other countries, uh, but also a lot of interesting things going on domestically. Uh, more workers are going, are self-employed, or part of the sharing economy, working for an Uber, working part-time. Um, so in, my, in the analysis I did, I was very careful not to just look at the unemployment rate as a measure of slack. I also brought in things like hours worked relative to normal hours, um, share of workers who are self-employed, some of whom may not want to be, although some may choose that. Uh, share of workers who are part-time, um, people who've dropped out of the labor force, things like that. Um, and I found in my results that having that broader measure actually significantly improved the fit of the Phillips curve. So those other dimensions of the labor market are very important. Um, but the reason I didn't talk about that much, and I assume we haven't much, is we have a next panel on this, and they're going to focus on that. So um, hopefully that will also get at your questions in much more detail. All right, we're out of time, but please join me in thanking this very interesting panel. Thank you. Don't forget your Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.